Good morning. <laughs> there we go. Thank you all. Feel free to come and grab a seat. Um, I am Kate Warren, Executive Vice President, Executive Editor at DevX, and really excited to welcome all of you for our first event, kicking off three days events right here at Noi House uh, on the sidelines of UNGA. We are really excited to dig into many topics over the next three days. So we're so happy you're here for our first event. Please feel free to stick around for the rest of the day and the next coming days. Um, but we have a really exciting session planned for you this morning that um, we are hosting at DevX and sponsored and convened by MSD for Mothers and WHO's Country Connector on Private Sector Health to talk about sustainable approaches to improve maternal health and achieve UHC through private sector collaborations. Um, you know, as of 2020, there is an estimated 240 billion in funding available from capital markets. And if we mobilize just 1% of this, it will address the entire SDG funding gap. Yet despite this, all right. <laughs> um, but you know, a lot of strategic engagement from LMIC, LMIC governments with private sector um, still hasn't really realized um, this potential and we'll be exploring pathways to that in today's session. Um, want to thank MSD for Mothers for uh, collaborating with us uh, on this event today. Um, you'll hear a little bit <clears throat> more about them later. But to kick us off, I would like to welcome to the stage our first panelist right here. And we have Carmen Sachiko Villar, who is Vice President of Social Business Innovation at MSD, and Nick Pearson, Co-Executive Director of Jacaranda Health. You both can sit right here. So thank you both for joining us today. Thanks for um, having us. Great. Got your... So Carmen, I'd like to start, uh, start with you. Why is MSD focused on leveraging private sector um, capacity to address the uh, health gap. Yeah, well, first, just let me say thank you for having MSD here today and to my uh, fellow colleagues in the fight and um, all of the distinguished guests here today. Thank you uh, for letting us have this time with you this morning. I think that um, the easy answer is why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't the private sector get involved in solving or helping to solve some of uh, the world's greatest health challenges? I think the deeper answer <clears throat> is really that we are committed uh, to improving access to health for people all over the world. We know that about half of the world's population does not have good access to health. We also know that if we think about the broader frame and where we are in progress towards the SDGs, we're not doing as well as we could be doing. And there's a lot of factors that have played into that including this thing called COVID, <clears throat> I think that has set us back in our systems. We know that there are financial uh, restraints on a lot of governments where um, perhaps we're working it with a country in partnership to develop some health access programs. And uh, Ministry of Health is very supportive, but Ministry of Finance might not have the budget to commit. So how do we help create, as a partner from the outside looking in, give our technical advice, give our support financially, uh, give our expertise <clears throat> to help us advance those health systems that are so critically important to include things like supply chain, to include things like laboratory expertise, to include things that we know that people need from the very basics to the highly digital NAI. And for every place we work, that's a little bit different. Now I have to say that MSD for Mothers has been in existence for just about a dozen years now. And with our commitments in the private sector, we've helped mobilize an additional $450 million to address maternal mortality around the world. <clears throat> Sometimes you need somebody to help galvanize those commitments to bring people to the table in sessions like this and talk about some of our most urgent health challenges. The private sector can help do that. We can help do a lot of things, but we can't do everything. We don't necessarily understand what's happening in communities. We need local input and partnership. And I have to say, we're gonna hear from Nick just now, but Jacaranda Health has been a great partner of ours. And we continue to work with organizations like his around the world to try to address maternal mortality 
and make sure that people have healthier quality access to health care. Great, thank you. And Nick, at Jacaranda Health, you partner with governments like in, in Nairobi and Kenya. Can you talk a little bit about that and the work that you're doing and how it's solving the, the gap in financing for health? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all here today, and uh, thank you for having us on the uh, on panel. Um, I'm here with you today, my colleague Cynthia Kahambura and Job Makoyo, who really spearhead our government partnerships, could probably provide a more sophisticated answer, but for visa and logistics reasons, you've got me, <laughs> but uh, great to see you. Um, so like most of you here in the audience, Jacaranda is primarily concerned with elevating mother's voices in the health system and ensuring that all moms get access to safe and respectful childbirth uh, so that we can see good outcomes. and. Um, our approach, as you said, is to work primarily with um, government partners to really address some of what we see as the most sort of challenging gaps to improving quality of care and outcomes for moms and babies. Uh, our team of about 100 people is based primarily in Nairobi, and I was struck we were also started about 12 years ago, so we were kind of crib mates, obviously, on a much smaller and more local scale. <laughs> but um, our approach really is to, um, we, we work through two, uh, two primary programs with the government to address uh, gaps, in, uh, gaps in care in Kenya. So we have a digital health platform that works directly with mothers to engage and empower them during pregnancy uh, and the postpartum period to ensure that they receive care at the right time in the right place. Um, and also that they have a platform to share their experiences during childbirth uh, around quality of care, around respect, so that that feedback can be looped into improving quality of care in the health system. Secondly, our other platform is really around direct working directly with frontline health providers in uh, the government hospitals where most moms are delivering. Um, and we've had the opportunity over the, right now we're working at about a scale of about half of the counties, county governments in Kenya, uh, across the country, a couple of million mothers uh, who are going through the health system and sort of walking with them on their journey. And in the last uh, year or two, we've had the opportunity to work with MSD for Mothers on a program that helps us sort of deep dive into those partnerships with county governments and really uh, look a layer deeper at like how can private sector players like us really support um, government partners who are really driving a lot of the care in the health system in um, improving better outcomes. I'm happy to share one or two examples of that if uh, if we have time, but I don't want to. Um... Yeah, no, well, speaking about uh, partnerships, uh, DevX and MSD for Mothers have been on a partnership and exploring how private sector can address a lot of these uh, gaps and challenges. Carmen, could you talk a little bit about that partnership um, and how it's playing a role in the work that you're doing in this area? Sure. Um, DevX has been a fantastic partner, actually. Um, we have lots of fantastic partners, uh, but really... This is being recorded, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that <clears throat> it's one thing to put in programs and partnerships to help address the issues on the ground. It's another thing to be able to talk about them and share the stories of success. Numbers matter. Data matters. But those stories and that narrative that go along with what, what we're doing and what we're accomplishing is critical. And DevX has, since the beginning, DevX has been a fantastic partner. Um, and I really, you probably don't remember this, but I was with, uh, with y'all in, in Davos um, before the pandemic and having a similar kind of forum and discussion around um, access to healthcare and just thinking that the enthusiasm and the amplification and the advocacy that was created from that kind of a partnership in that kind of a form was just tremendous. And we could not do it without committed partners like you at DevX. Um, I do think that we have partners at all levels and we're very focused also in local partners and how we can work more and better with them, thinking about people and women, especially around MSD for mothers who come from the communities in which we're trying to improve the quality of care. Yeah, so, you know, examples, storytelling are a very uh, powerful way of being able to communicate what are often very complex um, challenges. So, Nick, maybe you can get to some of those examples that you have to paint a picture for us of what it could look like. Thanks. Yeah. So apropos of, of the examples and the, the um, of how this works, we, as we've worked with a couple of counties in partnership with MSD from others, we found a few things where we think that private sector partners can really play an important role. And one example of that is around data. So leveraging some of the data that we see from others getting uh, as they 
go through their pregnancy journey, we're able to provide and co-create dashboards with our county governments. We see an increasing appetite and interest from both local and national level governments to be able to use some of that data to allocate resources that are scarce and constrained, but do it more equitably, do it in a way that's more efficient and, um, and get care to moms where they need it and when they need it. Um, and so co-designing with some of these county partners in Makwini County, for example, where the county health reproductive health coordinator is, you know, is, is helping us build the dashboards and then using some of those uh, examples of disrespectful care or gaps in prenatal care to be able to iterate and improve on the quality in the facility is really uh, is important and it's been really powerful, I think. Um, I think one thing that's important just to comment on is as we talk about private sector partnerships with the government, and this is, I think, hand in hand with the ethos of MSD for mothers, is that it's really clearly important that this isn't, we're not talking about a transactional or contractual partnerships. I mean, I think it's really important that private sector partners are um, looking at this as a long-term uh, game of co-design, uh, co-owning data uh, with government partners, because ultimately they're the ones who are responsible for the health systems, um, even though in certain instances they're going to be looking for help around certain, to fill certain gaps in the continuum of care. Can I just say one more thing? Sorry about partnerships. Um, Dr. Barbosa is here from PAHO, and later on this week, we're going to be signing a, a letter of intent to collaborate with PAHO. And, and I really do think that having a commitment at every single level is really important, from PAHO at the top uh, to the country governments and, and being able from the private sector to help grow those relationships and, and have them at all levels, not only in the delivery of the care that we're looking for and hopefully improving the lives of mothers and their families, but also at all levels so that our policymakers and our funders really understand what it is we're trying to do and why this is so important. So I want to say thanks to folks like Dr. Barbosa, but to all of you who are here from other countries and from local governments who help us do this work, we hope that we are helping you. And if we're not, we need to hear about it. <laughs> well, just quickly, um, before we move to the next session, you know, we had the high-level meeting on UHC. There's a lot of talk about this this week. What is one thing you hope to see come out of the meetings this week? A commitment to action. Yeah, I think we we come to these sessions, we convene ourselves, we talk a lot, we make commitments. Sometimes we don't always follow through on them. So what I would say is I really hope that the commitments that are made this week are actionable, there's follow through, and there's a commitment to find the resources that we need to do that, that work. Nick? That's a great question. I think uh, one of the things that I would love to see is a sort of a more nuanced view of how to integrate digital innovations into health systems. I mean, coming our start was in setting up sort of brick and mortar hospitals and really believe my wife is an obstetrician. We believe in the sort of human touch that's necessary in providing good care. But, you know, these digital systems and, and data tools are increasingly efficient. There's a lot of demand from government and from uh, moms themselves to be able to use SMS to navigate their pregnancies, et cetera. Um, but I would love for the conversation around that to be a little more nuanced, a little supportive of how digital can enable the health system better, but not just be a panacea or a silver bullet in some respects too. Great. Well, Nick, Carmen, thank you so much for your time today um, and sharing your insights with us. Yes, please give them a round of applause. <laughs> And so now I'm really delighted to welcome to this stage Marianne Atibet, who's at the AVP for Health Equity and Lead for MSD for Mothers, who will lead us in our next session. Thank you, Marianne. So good morning, everyone. Um, it is so great to see all of you here today, as well as all of you who are joining from around the world. Uh, through the webcast. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kate, Carmen, and Nick, uh, for setting us up. I think all of you recognize that the theme this year at UNGA is we are halfway through the race and we are behind. Um, and I think what we want to be able to share with you today is that we need to bring everybody onto the playing field. Nobody can be left on the sidelines, including private sector. And you've heard from Carmen and Nick at uh, different ways in which we can maximize and optimize the contributions of the private sector. 
what I'd really like to focus on on the panel and um, that I am really excited to introduce to you soon is what about all of the capabilities and all of the capacity that already exist in local economies, in local markets, in local communities? Are we doing everything we can to integrate those strengths into the game? You know, and I think we're going to hear from our panelists today. These are the folks who are leading on the practices, on the processes, on the policies, and are showing really persistent leadership um, to bring everything we have onto the playing field. Because I know, like so many of us, all of you, we're all in it to win it. We can't afford to not win. Um, I'm using a game as a metaphor, but this is actually life and death for billions of people. And what we are trying to do at MSD for Mothers, as Carmen alluded to, is to facilitate and galvanize a more inclusive playing field. Those billions of folks are not just recipients or beneficiaries. They should be active team members, active players. They should be calling the plays. They should be calling fouls. They should be coaching and they should be running with the ball. And so I'd love to invite our panelists uh, up onto the stage um, to share with us exactly how they are playing the game and how, with their leadership, um, we're going to get to that finish line. Um, so it gives me deep pleasure um, to call up onto the stage the Honorable Kazumbi Kandodo Chiponde, a Member of Parliament and the Honorable Minister of Health uh, from Malawi, um, Maduku Bwanji, ma'am. Um, welcome, welcome. Also, uh, I'd like to call up uh, Dr. Jabas Barbosa, who is the director of the Pan American Health Organization, also known as PAHO. Thank you, sir. And Ms. Mara Hansen Staples, the founder and CEO of Salient Advisory. And Dr. George Uzoemwane, um, who is the um, chair uh, of the Nigerian National Development Corporation. Please. Mm -hmm. So welcome all of you. Um, I'll start with a quick question. I know we don't always have so much time for these discussions, uh, but Honorable Minister, um, why after so many years, are we still really struggling to fully integrate the capabilities and the capacity of private sector into this um, race to the SDG finish line in 2030? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first, let me thank you for uh, in the invitation and also for organizing such a very important uh, uh, event. Good morning. Uh, all protocols observed uh, in the interest of time. Uh, a very important question indeed. I think uh, what I can say is that uh, for a long time, uh, the private sector in most of our countries, especially the low income countries, uh, they have been left out of the health sector. I'll give an example of our country, Malawi, uh, where all health services, they are for free. Uh, so it means it has been solely uh, on government shoulders. You know, so I think people, they have just taken it for granted. Uh, and then the private sector, they do their own things. Uh, also, you, you would notice that the private sector, most of them, they're on medical insurance. So they don't have to go to a government facility. They have other options. Uh, unfortunately, it is a very, very small percentage, uh, which means over 70% of our population, they have to depend on government uh, facility. So what we have done to address the same in our country is that now we have uh, initiated or launched what we are called uh, healthy financing uh, dialogue whereby we are inviting private sector, uh, but also CSOs, uh, our partners, uh, some organizations, uh, and government that we need to sit uh, around the table because uh, uh, we, we need to do a collective responsibility as Malawians. It's not just a, a government responsibility, but it is our responsibility. So we need to sit around the table so that, you know, uh, 
accepting and acknowledging that our fiscal space is very, very tight. And there are so many priorities among its priorities, agriculture, education, uh, and also health. But we need to be poor to put more. Uh, in our kit. So that is what we have started uh, to make sure that, you know, uh, the private sector is very much uh, involved in the health sector. Uh, let me also take uh, the advantage just to uh, thank our, uh, our partners, so many of them uh, who have really assisted us. Uh, we, we have come from far. I'll just give an example. Like uh, in the 90s, 1990s, uh, we'd lose about 1,100 uh, mothers uh, due to pregnancy-related issues among 100,000. Now the number at least has reduced to about 450, but still that's not good enough. Thank you so much. Congratulations. And, and that is no mean feat. You know, I think we've also heard that we are actually going in the wrong direction in many countries for maternal mortality including, as someone just pointed out to me in the audience here in the U.S., where the disparities are staggering. In New York City, where you're sitting right now, Black women are nine times, nine times more likely to die due to preventable causes of pregnancy, complications from pregnancy and childbirth than, than white women. So the fact that you've more than halved your maternal mortality rates um, is commendable. So thank you so much. Dr. Barbosa, I'll come to you next. Um, what would you love to see from a strategic perspective around private sector engagement with governments as well as with global platforms like PAHO and the WHO? What does what is, what is good look like to you? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. And first, thank you for inviting me to, to participate. As you know, the Americas is the, the region with uh, great inequalities in the world, not only inequalities among the countries, but also within the countries, as you mentioned, uh, even here in the US, but also in Central America, South America, in the Caribbean. Uh, in, in, in our region, when we look only for the national averages, we are not telling the whole story. So PAHO is very committed to work with the, the countries you know, to provide technical cooperation. We do believe that maternal mortality is an excellent indicator about the real access and quality of care. So uh, the countries in this region have committed with a very ambitious goal to achieve less than 30 uh, by 2030. It's half the FDG. But uh, we are not uh, in a good way to, to achieve this. You know that during the pandemic, we had a setback of, in some countries, we double the maternal mortality. We, for, we don't have time to go that, but you know, we know the reasons. So I think that uh, to achieve this very important goal and to guarantee that, that the vulnerable populations have real access to health services, we need to partner with private sector with a clear framework to avoid any kind of conflict of interest. But we are talking not only about the traditional private sector, providers of health services, pharmaceutical companies, but even with the new uh, private sector, let's say so, for instance, to promote and to develop the digital transformation, we need now to deal with telephonic uh, uh, and the internet providers uh, in the country. I do believe that we need to bring together all the, the private companies that you have that are interested to contribute with the countries to provide, the, I think, that this common platform to work together to learn from the good experiences that the private sector has in this region in order to improve access and to reduce uh, maternal mortality. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think you brought up this theme of data and we have to look under the hood of what the averages are telling us and actually lean into the power of digital and real-time data, as well as access, uh, you know, to folks in the last mile, meeting them wherever they are in their homes, in their, uh, in their homes, on their phones um, for that. So thank you so much. And I think the other thing I got from your response was we need to be running, you know, fast into the future um, and not let the health sector actually be the sector um, that is not capturing the promise of uh, digital technologies. Um, I'll actually come back to, to you, Mara, um, because I, I first want to talk about perhaps the positive, and then I want you to share um, some of the challenges. Um, so in terms of the positive, um, Dr. Uzowani, yeah, thank you. Um, 
you are and your team is doing an amazing job in the Niger Delta region in Nigeria in terms of integrating private sector with government um, strategy and, and government efforts and government goals. Can you tell us a little bit more about that work and actually why you think it's so successful? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm actually George Uzawane, Director of Education, Health and Social Services with the Niger Delta Development Commission. I came with um, the Senate Committee Chairman on the NDDC. I actually had to drag him here because he makes the laws that allow us to do what we need to do. So thank you very much for coming with coming along. Yeah. Okay, that being said, I need to give a background about the Niger Delta as a region. Um, it's an area of Nigeria in the south that has about 40 million people. That's very key to look at. That's the population of Canada and a bit more, right? Now, we also have in that same region some of the poorest people because they are not having the right access to health. So the Niger Delta Development Commission was formed by the government to, you know, to um, facilitate a rapid and sustainable development of the region so we could have a peaceful area and, um, you know, an ecologically clean area to do what the government has to do. And what the NDDC has been doing in healthcare, I'll just talk to one of the new things we're doing. We understand that government does not have the capacity to bring in the efficiencies of the private sector. We may have the departments, but we do not necessarily have all the expertise needed. And people expect government to provide healthcare as a social service. But the reality is that healthcare is a business. That's number one that we need to, you know, restart, start reinventing our minds. That healthcare is a business and should be treated as one. If we use the efficiencies of the private sector to run that, we'll achieve more. So the NDDC decided to go into public-private partnerships with the private sector to see how we can leverage those efficiencies to achieve more care, especially for the women who are actually the most disenfranchised, if I should use that word, in the Niger Delta area. Um, currently, we also know that data is the new gold, right? You cannot plan without the right data we might not have those efficiencies to also get the right data. So we are partnering with the private sector at the moment to see how we can register about 10 million women in the Niger Delta to have access to healthcare at the primary healthcare level. Now, most of these women live in the rural areas, in the undeveloped areas, but the doctors wouldn't go to live there, right? But then let's think about it. We do have our soft beverages. I wouldn't be calling any name, not to give them a free advert, but they are sold in every community, no matter how backward or far away it is. So why don't we use those same systems for vaccinations, for instance? Why don't we use those same systems to do healthcare? So we are working with the private sector now to register these women, have those data, you know, demographics, who they are, where they live, what they do, why do they have access, why they can't afford that, and then use that data to plan properly, especially for the women and the children and the most vulnerable people in society. And our goal is to have 10 million women registered over the next three years through the, you know, a, a partnership with the private sector. And I think we actually brought some of them with us as well so that, you know, um, they can see that we're looking at that technical partnership, the financial capacity to work with the private sector to um, achieve these goals. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, very, very inspiring. And, you know, I think one of the things that I take away from your work, um, as well as all of the collaborations we've had with partners in the room, is that we're not always going to get it right the first time. 
Um, but we have to keep on trying and iterating and learning um, from both our successes and our failures. And that's why it's really exciting, um, Mara, for you to be uh, on the stage and speak to, you know, what have we learned over the years in terms of integrating private sector? I know we, we've had, you know, a history of different types of partnerships, but I would love for you to speak to, you know, what you and your team was thinking about, you know, as you created the I3, you know, network and what are some of the challenges to integrating private sector with government and what can all of us do um, to actually make that frictionless, seamless and actually easy to do? Thanks for the question, Marianne, for having me. Um, so I'm part of an organization called Salient Advisory, and we track the emergence of health tech companies across the African continent. Um, we were founded in 2020 when we saw the emergence of health tech companies really um, exploding, and we're very excited to see new innovations in supply chain, telemedicine, patient engagement, and much more um, coming to the fore. But we realized many of these companies were operating in extraordinarily different, difficult environments and were likely to face you know, a valley of death that we've seen and, and fail to achieve impact at scale. So um, in 2022, we launched a program in, with the partnership of the Gates Foundation, MSD, Sencora, formerly Amerisource Bergen, Microsoft, and Chemonix, to look at a new way to operate together to try to support the, these local health tech companies that were, were operating in the areas of supply chain. And um, we have a particular focus, of course, on African-led companies, companies led by women and companies operating in Francophone Africa, because we know a lot of those health tech companies receive disproportionate, um, disproportionately low funding and support from folks at the global level. And we just finished our first cohort of companies, 30 companies that we supported in supply chain. And Marianne, I don't have lessons learned for you yet, but I have some big questions that I'm asking. Um, and the first thing that comes to mind is that, um, you know, the goal of the investing in innovation program was to offer these companies a grant of $50,000, but most importantly, connections to institutional customers, because we realized that health tech companies can't achieve impact at scale if they aren't partnering with NGOs, with governments, with industry, et cetera. So we really wanted to introduce leading companies to customers that could help bring their impact to scale. And as we reflected on the first year of um, what happened in our introductions, we realized that companies were more successful in securing partnerships with governments than any other type of partner. So the number of subnational and national governments um, startups were able to sign contracts with outstripped the number of partnerships they were able to secure with donors, with industry, with global health institutions. And my team at Salient looks at the ecosystem more broadly and actually just released a report that shows this trend holds true across the continent. We see in the area of supply chain, there are now more than 50 different partnerships with leading governments on the continent um, between these startups and national and subnational governments to improve supply chain services. And a lot of these partnerships are in order and inventory management in which governments are trying to ensure that um, local clinics, hospitals, and pharmacies have great availability, affordability, accessibility of essential products for maternal health and more. And so the big question in my mind is what are we doing as other actors at the global level in industry, in donor institutions, as a part of global health um, partners to follow the lead of these pioneering governments? How do we adjust our procurement processes quite drastically? How do we support partnerships that are emerging in new ways? Um, because there are governments out there who have tremendous respect for who are looking to invest in both local jobs as well as new ways of doing business in the health sector, building more sustainable health markets for the future. And I think all of us at the global level now need to, to figure out how to get, get behind these partnerships and, and support what works. So I'm excited to figure out the answers to those questions through the leadership of the people on this stage and, and yourselves in the room. But I think it's, it's time to ask ourselves, what will we do differently? Thank you so much. And, and I love the point you made about now we have businesses developing, sorry, delivering essential supplies. And, and that means the aid money that was going to support supply chain can now be diverted to do something else. We are in you know, uh, an era of, um, as Carmen mentioned, really 
competitive um, competing priorities for the scant resources that we have. And so I'd actually love to call on Dr. Jeffrey Smith um, from the Gates Foundation, you know, to, to talk about the role of foundations in these ecosystem and how the Gates Foundation is thinking about uh, public-private partnerships as well. Thanks, Marianne. <clears throat> You know, at the Gates Foundation, we really recognize we're, we're born out of the private sector. The philanthropy money that we have is a result of the private sector. And so we really look at partnerships and a variety of different types of solutions. We know that we have to strengthen the health system because it's through government and it's through the health system that the majority of services are delivered, especially to the poorest and the most vulnerable. But we also recognize that we have to, that the, the public sector, the government is not the only solution and should not be the only solution. The government demonstrates leadership, but the government can call upon the contribution of the private sector in many different ways. Um, many in this room know that I'm a huge fan of midwives, so you won't be surprised that I'll say one of the ways that the foundation is now leaning in more uh, in looking at expanding private, expanding services for mothers and newborns is by expanding midwifery. We recognize that, that midwives can provide the majority of health services that women, mothers, and newborns need at lower cost and probably better quality. I'm a male obstetrician and I recognize a little bit of the problem is the obstetric patriarchy. And I think sometimes we are pushing a little bit too hard to, to ensure that the obstetricians have their private practice. Why can't the midwives have their private practice? They're more available, they're more accessible, and they provide woman-centered care at higher quality. Thank you, and, and they're in the communities as well. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, you, you mentioned the role of government as key, key stewards um, of, um, of this work. I'd, I'd love to call on um, Dr. Soraya Dali from WHO and, you know, um, for her to share some of the work that we are doing with the WHO through a collaboration called the um, Private Sector Country Connector. And the role, as I mentioned, is how do we facilitate this inclusive playing field, um, but how do we also make sure that government, WHO, can be stewards, you know, of these type of strategic engagements? Thank you very much. The, the Ministries of Health of 21st century has a role and responsibility to, to steer the health sector and to govern the health sector. And that means to bring all the stakeholders, including private sector, including communities and people into this discussion. When it comes to private sector, we know their role. And let me start with some data. WHO estimates that nearly 40% of services in PAHO region, and we know Director of PAHO is here, in Africa region and in Western Pacific region are provided by the private sector. 70%, no, 57% of healthcare services in Southeast Asia and almost 62% of services in Eastern Mediterranean region have been provided by private sector. So we can see that private sector is a big stakeholder when it comes to service provision. Now, the scale is different from country to country and within the country in terms of being formal, being informal, for-profit, non-for-profit, etc. However, the, the, the responsibility of the ministries of health today is to steer them, to engage with them, to regulate them, also in terms of legislation uh, and, and laws, and also to, uh, to have an oversight, to monitor them um, and, and, and make them part of the entire process from planning to delivery to monitoring uh, and so on. Now, what WHO is doing specifically in this regard is that through our country connector platform, and you are, you, you, many of you are aware, are aware with that platform, we provide a platform 
four countries and also for the WHO regions and headquarters to share experiences, to share norms, um, and also for us to disseminate the global norms and standards to support learning and to provide guidance. Now, um, since the floor is with me, I would also like to say that when we talk about mothers, postpartum hemorrhage is still a big issue. And I would like to emphasize that for the last more than 20 years, WHO Sexual Reproductive Health and Research Department has been coordinating research to find best drug alternatives for prevention and treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. And that we in WHO helping to developing and disseminating guidance on postpartum hemorrhage and to provide tailored support to countries in their work towards PPH, postpartum hemorrhage. And also there's a gross underinvestment in, mater in maternal health compared to several disease conditions and that maternal mortality issue in the last five to 10 years unrelated to COVID-19 have stagnated. So it is a neglected condition. And as we speak about equity, as we speak about midterm or midpoint at the SDGs, it's important to take stock of that and to make sure that women, when they give birth, they don't die. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. And I am especially appreciative, um, Dr. Daly, of you bringing up the point of equity um, and making sure we are leaving nobody behind and all of the different mechanisms that we have um, in order to hold ourselves accountable to that vision. So thank you so much. We have time for maybe one question from the floor. I see someone in the back who was not shy of raising her hand. <coughs> So if you can wait for the mic, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Afra. I'm a research fellow at Harvard Medical School, uh, working in the global surgery space. Um, I, I think for those of us who do work in government partnerships um, and who are working at NMICs, I'm just wondering like, what you would ask or what we, how you would suggest we can incentivize the private sector to engage in collaborations um, without having to rely on goodwill. Um, I think that's sort of a challenge that we're facing at the moment. So any advice would be appreciated. Great. So the question is around how do we incentivize the private sector to join on this mission? So um, would the minister or Dr. Barbosa like to take that? Uh, thank you so much for uh, that question. Uh, for me, in the first place, if you're a managing director, you must have come from somewhere. You have your relatives, you have your sisters, you have your aunties in the rural area. That enough should be an incentive. So uh, they need to, to, to understand that they have a responsibility as well. Because even the private sector, those companies, to be successful, there are people, the Malawians, the citizens working for them. So they have a responsibility to give back to the people. That should be able to drive us. Uh, all the time, you know, we need a mindset change, I should say. We need a mindset change. We need citizens to know that this is our responsibility, collectively responsibility. We understand that we have partners, but before my neighbor comes in, those inside my house, they need to do something about it. So uh, it's not an event, uh, it, is, uh, it is a process, a process whereby we need to engage each other, we need to sit down, uh, we should not just expect that it's, it's going to happen like that, uh, no, but we need to talk to them, we need to engage them uh, so that they accept the situation that they should also be part of providing solutions. It's not good that we lament all the time, you know, you know things are not going on well, uh, come and help us. Uh, meanwhile, ourselves are not doing anything. We need to start doing something ourselves, but it's not an event. It is a process, but it is a process which indeed, if we put an effort to it, it can reap a lot of benefits. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. 
just to add something, I think that uh, I fully agree with the <clears throat> this comment from the minister, but I also want to add that uh, first is to recognize that the private sector is already carrying on many important activities in the health sector. So we are not talking about the future. We are talking about how we can recognize, how we can coordinate better, how we can join efforts to do that. In the case of Latin America and the Caribbean, for instance, how we can use the many, uh, several different initiatives that the countries are carrying on, that the private sector are participating in some of them to overcome the barriers, economic, social, cultural barriers that we have the, to, to deliver the cost-effective measures that we know can prevent maternal mortality. So I think that this, is, this means working with midwives and traditional midwives né, to reach out to the indigenous population, how we can uh, work with the community leaders to reach out the families that live in the slums, in the big cities in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. So I think that we have a lot Lots of uh, good activities going on, and sometimes I know the prejudice or the thinking that we cannot avoid the conflict of interest are, I think, that a barrier that you really need to overcome. I think that's important to do that now. Thank you. Maybe 30 seconds, Madam Diop. Thank you so much, and thank you, uh, MSD for Mother, for bringing us uh, always at the margin of the UNGA. So uh, it's such a platform with private sector, public, private, and those who are also working in this area. So thank you. Um, I'm uh, here, you know, as my heart, another one from the African Union. And uh, just to say, we are very happy to see member states here. Uh, Malawi sharing the experience. You know, we have standard setting like, um, you know, at the African Union, an agenda to improve women and children health care. And you know that, um, but also the campaign, the karma, the campaign to accelerate the reduction of maternal uh, mortality. But you don't want to st just to stop there, to have the standard, to have the campaign, but what we need is really accountability, is that what is exactly the implementation at local, at national level. And that's where we are working with MSD for Mother in our advocacy with a big group of uh, women's and uh, women's rights in Africa, GMAC, and uh, to collect the data, but also the stories. I like what was said, that you need to put the stories in the platform, uh, like, um, you know, for the experience, what's happening in Senegal could be shared with uh, in Malawi, but also uh, in other places, uh, in Comoros, uh, for example, uh, using the MSC and other digital platform. So um, I just wanted to also to echo what was being said by Gate Foundation, the midwives, you know, those are the ones that we need to put at the center. And uh, for example, in Senegal, we have the what we call the Badja Nugoh, it's something in our local languages, but it is really supported by private sector and government. And this is something that is very innovative, that is part of the system that we need to recognize and share. So it's not about policy only, it's about data, but also is about putting the experience of the women themselves, their voices and their faces. Thank you. So that is exactly the message we want to end on. Thank you so much, Madam Diop. Before we all go, I'd just like to call on our coaches. It's halftime. Your players are going back into the field. What's the thing you're telling them as they're going back into the field to, to win this game? I'll start with you. Uh, thank you very much. Well, um, what I'll just be saying is answering our question as well. We need to look at healthcare as a business. It's already existing, but not efficiently. We need the private sector to come in. Um, in the Niger Delta, for instance, we train birth attendants. We do not kill their business. 75% of the women are de delivered by midwives and traditional birth attendants. So we are actually their competitors. They are not the competitors to the doctors. So the reality is that we need to strengthen the midwives and allow them run their businesses 
and know their limits to refer to the next station. The cost of a woman leaving her community to go to the city to get care. If you have that care in the cities, the, business, the private sector should bring that care to the villages, to the communities, and that's a lot of money. 40 million people in the Niger Delta, probably 2 million pregnant women, that's a lot of business. Thank you. I would just say what's gotten us this far won't get us all the way to the end. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us to figure out how do we invest in, how do we partnership, how do we partner with um, local companies in each of these markets, with young midwives who are coming up and building their businesses in new ways? How do we stretch ourselves to do business differently, to follow their lead and to follow the lead of the governments um, uh, who, are, who are pioneering progress? Thank you. Dr. Barbosa, halftime chair. <laughs> I think that the I think that the most important message, and as we heard for many different reasons, that we really need to to think how we can uh, how we can uh, assess all the very good experiences, initiatives that have already been implemented, and how we can scale up them. I think that this is the moment because uh, we are living the most acute phase of the pandemic, but we are not happy to. Uh, to go back to where we were in 2019, we need to move it further. And to do that, we need to work together. Thank you so much. Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, what can I say? All of us, we came from a woman. That's how important a woman is. Since we came in this morning up to now, there must be a woman who have died somewhere due to lack of services due to lack of infrastructure, due to lack of equipment. That makes us all failures. One death, it's too much. It is our responsibility. So I would urge, it's a call to action to all of us, a private sector, organization, all of us, we have a part to play. We have a role to play in order that we improve maternal services globally. Malawi, uh, Niger, Nigeria, Zambia, Kenya, we are all one. We are all under humanity. So I urge you that let's hold hands. We can make a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, panelists. Thank you, guests. And thank you, DevEx. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Marianne. Just quickly, I do want to thank MSD for Mothers and WHO Country Connector and Private Sector Health for convening this conversation with us. Please feel free to stay. We have at 11 o'clock. Uh, another event coming up in partnership with AstraZeneca on how improving kidney health can transform health systems for all. And we have lots of uh, fun activities planned over the next three days. So please stick with us and thank you for joining us this morning.